May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is found in the Gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 10, verses 23 to 28, where we read as follows that portion of God's Word, which will be the sermon text. Speaking of Jesus, it says, And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. So far the text. In the name of Jesus, who has redeemed us from the curse of the law, their fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true only living, creating, and preserving triune God. I had just become a pastor. I held in my hand my diploma from the seminary. I had spent four years studying for the public ministry and was assigned. I had received a call from a congregation in West Virginia. So off I went with my wife and our one child. Off we went to West Virginia, it was July. Uh, I had graduated in June. Well, I hadn't arrived, but just arrived in Charleston, or in Huntington, West Virginia, but I read in the newspaper that within a few days, there was going to be a concert right down the road in Charleston, West Virginia, a concert by Elvis Presley. And boy, was it big news. It was all over the paper before and after the concert. It was the biggest thing to happen in Charleston in months. Tickets to the concert had been sold out months in advance. The profiteers, the scalpers, were selling the tickets for $100 apiece. Now, that was a lot of money back in 1975. But you had to have that ticket to get in, that precious ticket to get into that concert. And everybody, it seemed, wanted to get into that concert. But you had to have the ticket. Well, the night of the concert came. Not everybody had a ticket. The ones who had a ticket were very happy to have that ticket because they were in. They got into the concert hall. I remember reading in the paper, it talked about one lady She'd had her purse stolen a few weeks before, but she was happy. She didn't care about the purse. She didn't care about what was in the purse. All she cared about was her Elvis ticket wasn't in the purse. She had her ticket. She got in. The people who got in were so happy. They got into the concert. The people who didn't get in, who didn't have the ticket, were, were sad. And they were lined up for blocks. 
outside the concert hall, those who had tickets, and there was probably a few who didn't have a ticket, and were looking to maybe buy one on the street, or maybe they'd have a few left to sell at the box office. It seemed like everybody wanted to get into the concert. It was the place to be that night, and the place was jammed to the rafters to hear Elvis. Now, why do I bring this up? This reason. Would that people were as concerned about getting into heaven as they were about getting in to see Elvis. Because you see, you need a ticket to get into heaven. A precious ticket. Not everybody's going to get in, the Bible says. And those who get in will be very happy, and those who don't will be very sad. Would that churches that preach the way to heaven were as jam-packed with people lined up around the block to get in as they were to get in to see Elvis. But you see, people aren't. By and large, people don't think about heaven and hell, and eternal life. Why not? Well, I'm going to read a quote to you from the London Times. Among the causes of diminishing church attendance and the relaxation of moral standards, there can be little doubt that one of the chief has been the disappearance of the belief in eternal punishment. Right or wrong, people are not afraid of God as they used to be." Unquote. People feel, well, if there is a heaven, everybody's going to get in. And I don't think God would punish anyone, so I don't think there's a hell. So why go to church? Why read the Bible? Robert Ingersoll was a famous atheist many years ago. He gave a lecture one night in a lecture hall. He began his lecture by saying, tonight I'm going to prove conclusively that the idea of hell, eternal punishment, is the figment of the imagination a wild dream of some theologians to dupe gullible people? Well, about this time, there was a man in the audience who had had too much to drink. And uh, he shouted out, You tell us, Bobby. We're counting on you. Make it good. Make it plain. Make it clear. Because if you're wrong, we're all lost. Would that people were more concerned about eternity, concerned about hell, concerned about heaven, or that they were concerned about not this life or this world, but more concerned about the next life, the next world, which the Bible says surely is there. But what I see in people today is a lack of concern about eternity. They don't care. They don't think about it. They think, well, there is no hell. I don't want to worry about that. There's probably no heaven. I don't have to worry about that. Things that the Bible says a hundred times are there and that everybody will face. People don't care about it today. What do they care about? They care about the here and the now. This life, this world, they're all consumed with this thing now. I hope they find a cure for cancer. That's what they care about. I want to find my eternal life here. 
They're a hundred times more concerned about that. Would that more people were concerned about what this lawyer in our text was concerned about. He came to Jesus and he asked, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Would that more people ask that question today? Concerned about eternal life. Now, it also says here that he was testing Jesus. He didn't really want an answer. He was trying to trip Jesus up. And you can tell that from the way he asked the question. Master, what shall I do? to inherit eternal life. The man obviously thinks that it's all up to him. That he must do something to earn heaven. That's his idea. That's his thought. He thinks he's already figured it out. He wasn't really wanting to find out how to get to heaven because he already thought I know how to get to heaven. I must do something to earn it. So Jesus lets him answer his own question. You got it figured out? You tell me the answer. You think you know how to get to heaven, sir? You tell me. He didn't fall for his trap. Jesus turns it right back on him. Answer your own question. So the man says, well, Jesus said, what is written in the law? How readest thou? You want to talk about what you must do? What's the law of God say that you must do? By the way, again, that's like most people today. They think you've already got it figured out. You try to tell them the real way to heaven. They don't want to hear it. Because I think that they've done what they need to do, if there is a heaven, to get there. And they won't listen to the real way to heaven, the real ticket. They think they've already got the ticket. So they won't listen. Just like this man. They won't listen to the truth because they think they're good. They think they've kept the law of God good enough. But anyway, the lawyer answers Jesus and answering, and he answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor is thyself. That's his answer. Let's think about that answer for just a moment. Because that is the law of God. That's the summary of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. With all thy strength, that doesn't mean your muscles. That means with everything within your power, all that you control, all of your possessions, use everything you have, all that you control to serve God. All the time. All your strength. It says, with all your soul. What's your soul? Well, that's your personality. What you think all the time. Your whole personality, all your thoughts are to be permeated constantly, night and day, 24-7, 365, all the time. Your whole personality permeated with love for God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your mind, Thinking of God all the time. 
praying to God all the time. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Not just a little bit, all the time. Channel your whole thought process, your whole mind upon God's word, the Bible, all the time. Shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Not half-hearted, not part of your heart. That's lukewarm. All thy heart, all the time. Love nothing more than God. Leave no stone unturned to serve him. And then, love thy neighbor as thyself. Never a jealous thought towards anyone. Never an envious thought. Never an impatient thought. No selfishness at all. You do and you suffer for your neighbor as for yourself. Now the lawyer asked the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He was probably thinking, oh, he'll say some one single great work I must do for the church. Just one thing, one, one great thing. That'll get me into heaven. I think a lot of people think this when they die and they leave the church some money in their will. They think, oh, that'll be the one great thing that gets me in when I die. Just one great thing. No, no, that's not it at all. Jesus doesn't say that. Just follow God's law. Perfectly. Perfectly. One act here, one act there, that doesn't cut it. Your whole life, all your thoughts, if you want to save yourself. Because God will look at every second of your life when you stand before Him in judgment. Every second, your whole life. Not just a few things that you did. Everything that you thought, said, and did will be judged. Jesus said in verse 28, He said unto the lawyer, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. All you have to do is live up to this without ever once Breaking it. Not a single break. One failure to do what you just said would bring in sin. And that's a whole new ballgame. The Bible never says, Jesus never said, that a human being cannot be saved by his works. But not just any old works, not our standard of works, not your standard of works, not the world's standards of works, God's standard. This is God's standard. You can save yourself if you do this, in verse 27, perfectly your whole life. You can, but you must do it perfectly. It's either perfection or damnation. That's the rules. And that's where the difficulty comes in. What Jesus was trying to point out to this lawyer and to you and all of us, that you are a human being. You are descended from sinners, starting with Adam and Eve. You have inherited their sinful nature and therefore, what it says in verse 27, you, you can't do. It is impossible to do it for you. You cannot follow the law of God perfectly. So, the avenue to heaven by the law of God is closed to us. 
The Bible puts it this way. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Jesus says in verse 28, This do. This do. This do. And thou shalt live. And we haven't done it. We haven't done it. The world is cut off and separated from God because of this. Because of sin. Now, the Bible says it on every page. But even if you don't read the Bible, you can just look around and see it. Look at the world around you. You can see that it's cut off and separated from God. Look at the evil in the world. Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. Well, no one's doing it. But there is one other way to live. One. One other way, and that's in our text in verse 23. Jesus turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed, not cursed, but blessed, are the eyes which see the things that ye see. And what did they see? What did the disciples of Jesus see? What did they hear from Jesus? They heard from Jesus, first of all, that he is the Christ, the promised Savior of the Old Testament. He said he was. The high priest asked Jesus, are you the Christ? He said, I am. The woman at the well in Samaria said, the Christ is coming. Jesus says, I am he. Jesus got up in the synagogue in Nazareth, asked for the book of Isaiah, read a passage out of it and says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'm he. I'm the one this is talking about. Before Abraham was, I am. I am God come to save you, just as was promised in the covenant of the Old Testament. Jesus is God. That's what he told his disciples. That's what they saw with their eyes. That's what they heard with their ears. And blessed were they that they saw and heard this. He's not just a man. Oh, he's a true man. But he's unlike any other man in that he never sinned because he's also God the Son. Blessed are those who see this and come to know and believe this. And why would God, our creator, become a man in this sinful world? Well, he said very clearly to his disciples and to anyone who has ears to hear, I came to seek and to save that which was lost, to give my life a ransom for many. Well, we are lost because we can't do the things mentioned in God's law that we are commanded to do. We've broken it. We are lost. Lawyer probably didn't understand that, but we must come to understand that. We cannot be saved by the law. We cannot save ourselves by doing good. We can only be saved by Jesus. Because he came to give his life a ransom for many. He came to shed his blood for our sins. The blood that he will give us in a few moments. And with and under the wine of communion. And when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, this is, my, this is my blood, which is shed for you, in your place, to pay for your sins, so that your sins may be remitted by God. This is how your sins are forgiven. Because God himself came and paid the full price of your sins on the cross. 
He died for your sins. Blessed are the eyes which see these things. This is what lifts the curse of our sins from us. The Bible says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. John the Baptist looked at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The lawyer answered with the law of God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. That doesn't show us the way to heaven. That shows us our sin. That shows us that we're lost. That shows us that we're sick and need a physician. But Jesus is that physician. He is the remedy for our sin. The law of God doesn't give us hope when we read it. It gives us despair, for we know we have not done it. But Jesus has the word of comfort. Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. The law says, pay your debt to God. You haven't kept his law. Jesus says, I have paid it for you. The Bible says, the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Faith. Faith in Jesus. That's what saves us. Not our works of the law. They damn us. But Jesus saves us. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Faith in Christ must come first. Then we can begin to follow the law of God somewhat. But faith in Christ must come first. The good works will follow. Not to save us, but flowing out of that faith in Christ. Many, many years ago, it was probably in that church in Huntington, West Virginia, a member of my congregation, a lady, came to me one day, she said, well, I know the Bible says that we're not saved by our works, but by faith in Jesus. That we can't obey the law of God, and that's not, that's not the way to heaven. But, my, pastor, don't you think that's a dangerous thing to preach? That, that you don't have to obey the law of God to get to heaven? Why, if, if, if the members of the church knew that, they'd just go out and do anything they wanted to do, wouldn't they? And I said to her, well, you know what the Bible says. You know that by obeying God's law, you can't get to heaven. That is by faith in Christ alone. Now, are you going to go out and do all the bad things you can think of? And she looked at me with horror and she says, well, of course not. And I said, well, why not? And she says, well, because I, I love God. I love Jesus. I hate sin. And he answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. 
Now, if you don't think you need Jesus, live up to that. Amen. I may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.